Good day, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dialogue Over Division. And today I have my first non-Canadian guest on the show, and I have Mike Donio. Donio. <laughs> I swear, every time I have someone, I get it right before, and then as soon as I try to say it, I get it wrong. So it's Mike Donio, and Mike is a scientist, biochemist, molecular biologist in biotech, and has started a company called Science Defined. And why I wanted to chat with him today is it seems like he's got a similar message about just the more we understand about the science realm, the better we can advocate for ourselves. And it's a very similar message I'm hoping to instill in Canada about civic responsibility. And I, I very much believe it all starts with ourselves personally. If we're not able to take care of our health and wellness, it's very difficult to take care of our family, our community, and our country. So we might as well get started with ourselves. So with that, maybe Mike, if you could give me a bit of an introduction about who you are and then how you got to doing what you're doing. Yeah. Um, first, thank you so much for, for having me on. I really, really appreciate the opportunity, uh, and it's great to chat with you today. Um, so, yeah, so I have been a research scientist for more than 20 years, um, doing largely research in the lab. Most of that has been in industry, so in pharma and biotech. Most recently, um, this is up to about October of 2021, I was a senior scientist at a biotech company in the immuno-oncology space. So this was developing therapeutic antibodies to treat cancer. And these are antibodies that engage the immune system. And um, the strategy is usually either to retarget it to cancer cells or activate it. Many times the, the cancer can silence certain immune mechanisms that would otherwise uh, activate and target it. So it's leveraging the immune system to target cancer using antibodies. I helped to develop and bring two antibodies to clinical trials. Again, that all led up to about, um, I think early September in 2021, when the entire industry, my company included, rolled out uh, mandates for the COVID jab. And um, I submitted a religious exemption and my company basically declined it and gave me kind of a very, very brief ultimatum to, to take it or not. And I stood my ground and they unceremoniously showed me the door. Um, since then, I've been speaking out about the current state of scientific research, about kind of the pharma biotech industry and, and all things COVID. As you said, I started a new project uh, that I've called Science Defined that's all about um, helping people to understand science, the language of science, as, as I kind of put it, and making, uh, empowering people to better advocate for themselves. Yeah, and I think, like I said already, it's such a great message. And um, I am a lawyer, but I did a science degree uh, originally, so I did biochem and all those organic chemistries. Now I can't remember. It was so long ago. So I'm a little bit familiar with the language, but clearly, you know, not um, as well versed as you. And I'd like to hear your opinion of what was the most glaring or alarming thing that you saw when or what was your assessment of what was going on in your industry when when the COVID uh, that issue was coming up? Like, what were some of the things that you saw in your industry that you were like, what, what is happening? Where is this discussion going? I think for me, what I observed, um, and to, you know, to be fully honest, I mean, the company that I was working for, it was clinical stage, so we're fairly advanced, but yet still a startup and pretty small. Um, mm -hmm. But still, I think the most kind of remarkable and shocking thing to me was really the kind of lack of discussion about it. The uh, majority of people that I worked with basically just gave in. Well, I don't know, gave in, but they, because they had a free choice, but they really didn't 
think too much of it. They just did what they were told, and there was not a whole lot of discussion. Now, when the mandates started coming out, there were some people that kind of expressed that they might have been going a little bit too far, but yet at the end of the day, when when push came to shove, I, I believe I was the only one that ultimately pushed back and was, you know, faced any kind of repercussions. I find that so interesting, too. And um, it's funny that there just weren't discussions, as you said. And what I found, at least, from looking at, from a more professional level, what I think happened is that when you're in a profession, and correct me if you think I'm wrong here, you know, you know your area of specialty pretty well. And I think a lot of people assumed that somebody else was dealing with somebody else, an immunologist, was the one that was, but then the immunologist said, no, it's the vaccinologist. The vaccinologist said then it was uh, public health. And it, it turned into this big circle of, if you really look into it, nobody really seemed to know everything about it. And it was the people that were questioning it from a higher level, looking at it from many perspectives. I feel that those were the people that were um, questioning things and asking questions and trying to have conversations. I don't know if you saw that, like that narrowness in professional um, disciplines. Yeah, I mean, that's something that's um, definitely not uncommon these days where many, many people, especially in industry, many scientists are very... Um, I don't want to say, well, in, in, in some respects, we, we say that it, they're siloed, especially in big companies, but um, there is an over-specialization almost um, where certain people know specific areas really, really well, um, but then, you know, there are these gaps. And so you, you, you then kind of almost by default, you rely on other people or you look to, oh, well, I know this person or so-and-so or you know, you, you wind up going all the way up to a, you know, a Fauci or something in the United States or something like that to tell you, you know, advise you in terms of what, what am I supposed to do in this situation? And, you know, it's really unfortunate because science and biology is not something that should be um, that, that reductionist as it's become. It, you know, it, it sh we should learn to uh, to appreciate it from a, a wider scope. I mean, we are very complex um, beings and, you know, nothing works in isolation. So even if I know immunology really well or I know a specific, you know, pick some other discipline, I mean, it's not working in isolation. It's yeah. these things are all coming together to make you you and be alive and function so uh yeah it's quite remarkable yeah it, uh, so that was something i found and it's very similar in law you know you start specializing in one area and then people ask you advice on a criminal matter or a family law matter and i'm like well that's so much out of you don't want me doing that and i feel that that happened quite a bit during COVID, um and especially it was what I, looking back to what's a bit s the most sad, I think, is that it was uh, the people in the medical profession that were actually dealing with and or treating patients. Those were some of the people that were censored the most as well. And that's the most disheartening because if you want anyone contributing to the discussion, it would be the people that are dealing with it. But instead like I already said, the like from one area of specialization, they weren't really they talking to each other. But then from the top public health, they weren't talking to the people actually treating. So um, that's one thing that I found was happening a bit. Of course, it wasn't always the case. But um, and you mentioned it as well about science being, I think, not static. But this is one thing that bothered me a lot during this um, narrative is suggesting constantly that this is how it is. And I was like, this is the opposite of what science is. Science is constantly evolving and we want to keep um, testing it to make sure that 
we're on the right track. And when that discussion was silenced, that to me was very concerning. I don't know if you have thoughts or that's how you felt at the time as well. Yeah, we kept hearing this notion or phrase of the, you know, that the science is settled or to, to trust the science. And it's just, if you've ever been in science, to, I mean, to me, that was just an absurdity because I know how much science changes over time and how hard it is to find something that is in any way reproducible. I mean, we kind of m make it seem like often, especially when you look at published data, you, you it, it's often perceived that it's accurate and it's reproducible, but it, that's a far cry from everyday reality in the lab much more often we wind up with many more questions than we do answers when we when we do an experiment and it's a very very highly iterative process putting the re in research we like to joke but um and so very rarely do you ever get to a point where you would even come close to saying anything is settled or it's stationary i mean as a matter of fact scientific knowledge by definition is um conditional knowledge it's not it's it's uh it's not a type of knowledge like say mathematics where in theory two plus two always is going to equal four now some people may try to convince you otherwise nowadays but um in reality that is a static a priori knowledge it's an unchangeable fact um scientific knowledge is not that way even when it is elevated to to a point where it's where it's more um verified and trustworthy. So, you know, when we generate a hypothesis and then use that to design an experiment or experiments and we test that and we try to verify it and replicate it, that's very, very early level. After a time, if you verify and verify and you get more confident, then you can start to develop theories or laws. Well, even then, even when, you know, anybody can think of certain laws or theories that have been pretty well established. And, you know, some people in science, you might think that these things are stuck in like a, you know, in a museum on a glass shelf. They can't be touched, but that's far from the truth. They always should be questioned, tested. You can always generate new sets of data, new evidence that you can test a theory by. It's it should never, ever reach a point where it's just it's done, it's settled and we're going to just hold it above everything. And then it becomes dogma, right? It becomes a religion. And that's yeah. really bad. Well, one way to kind of, I guess, um, demonstrate that is until we can recreate a human being and recreate the planet. We don't know what's going on in this complexity mm -hmm. that is a human being or our planet. And that's one thing, like, I have a a very hard time with Western medicine. Sometimes I've had my own issues with it. And just, the, it, to me, it's a bit, it's arrogance of how much they understand the human body and how they know. And it's like, you are not, and it's very similar exactly to the COVID uh, discussion, is all intertwined, all uh, connected and yet we're constantly dealing with everything in isolation and it's such a huge problem so I don't know if you have any any like when the this kind of came up you know at, into the public narrative were there things that you were like oh geez I really wish people knew this or were asking this because I found it with the legal and political stuff I was like oh boy if we just if everyone kind of understood this a bit more, we would be in a much better position. Did you find that with the science discussion? Was it trust the science or was it other things as well that you you were just pulling your hair out hearing these things? Yeah, I mean, I think it kind of goes alongside the whole trust the science thing because then everything that kind of came along, whether it was the testing, whether it was just basic facts about what what was going on with respect to the the pandemic i mean people were were buying into what whatever anybody was saying especially what you know if it was a government official or someone in public health without even thinking twice about it and it and and so many things that were being tossed around just flew directly in the face of of 
science and even common sense. I mean, what the yeah. the types of uh, policy decisions and stuff that were being put forth. And it was like, can we just, I mean, sure. E you know, even if this is an incredibly um, challenging situation, that, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't take a second, take a deep breath and say, does this really make sense? Yeah. So I'm guessing that's kind of where you came up with your idea of science defined. And maybe if you could give me a bit of a history of that and, and what you're hoping to accomplish with that. Yeah. So um, I think there were two things, two, I guess, major things that I noticed throughout the, the COVID situation that really kind of inspired me to, to do something. Um, and I knew that we needed solutions versus just, you know, yeah. I mean, I can talk and we can talk like this forever and talk about all the issues and the problems and the trust, <laughs> the science and the, but that only gets us so Let's far. Let's do something. We need, right. We got to, if we're going <laughs> to change something, if we're going to equip people with a, a way to do something different, if, and when this happens again, you know, then we, then we need to, we need to have some kind of solution that's, that people can take action on. Um, in talking to friends, family, people in the community, I realized just how, you know, I took it for granted as a scientist because I hear stuff and being so immersed in it, to me, I, you know, it's easier for me to understand the language, that barrier and, and understand what's going on. But for people that weren't in that, like it was such a challenge because number one, the amount of information that was being yeah. thrown at people. And then number two, the highly technical nature. And so, you know, I can see how it's so easy when you're faced with that to just say, all right, I'm out. I don't want I don't, I don't have the time to take to, to understand this. I don't want, you know, I'm just going to go find someone that, that knows or listen to XYZ public health official and, you know, do what they say. But in reality, I, I realized like if we, if we could just distill this information for people, anybody can really become um, conversant such that they could understand and ask questions and discuss it and be able to better advocate for themselves. And yeah. then, you know, you heard, I, I kept hearing how um, on top of that, where people would ask questions, would want to know more and Yet they were told, oh, you're not a scientist. You're not a doctor. Yeah. You're not a this or that. Yeah. You don't get to ask questions. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. If we're being asked to do all of this stuff, if we're trying to protect our families, we all have a an obligation, really, to understand this at a higher level than just trust the science, listen to this guy or that guy, blind, uh, yeah. blind following. And so that really drove me more. I said, there's got to be a way to help people to understand this at, at sufficiently that um, that they can advocate for themselves. And so Science Defined is, um, is an educational platform that hopefully equips people to understand and navigate this complex scientific terminology and the concepts that are used by doctors and scientists and really anybody in the medical industry or people in public health. Um, and it's all about, you know, helping you to distill complex studies and things to, and, and apply them to, to your own life and to find, um, maybe most importantly, find sources of information, um, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that you can be confident in, that you can rely on it if you're a parent or whatever to make those difficult decisions. Do I take this thing or that thing? Do I, you know, adopt this? uh, policy or that are not, you know, um, is this something that's risk at, that myself or my kids are at risk? You know, how do we understand that? Um, and yeah. so I hope that science to find is something that can equip people to better, you know, advocate for themselves. And I, I very much agree with the mission <laughs> and <laughs> I'm trying to do the same in my own little way. And it was interesting that you said there was just so much information. It was technical. And then you went to the, um, I think one of the biggest challenges was the gaslighting and the canceling. And I don't know how it was in the United States. It was just 
insane here in Canada. And when you were talking about it, I just recalled this was before I was even remotely into like this public um, kind of persona that it's turned into was I had shared uh, the title of an, a headline of an article out of the States. And it was from Wall Street Journal or something like that, quite a reputable organization. And it had said that um, the vaccine's immunolo- immunity is waning and it's not, it only lasts six weeks, something to that extent. And the vitriol I got from people from that headline, it, they said it's because of people like me that their children aren't in kindergarten anymore. And I was just like, <laughs> hold on a second. Um, did you bring this concern to the Wall Street Journal that they're misreporting and misrepresenting information? Why are you attacking me? It was like, that was very sad to me. And I found that this has continued on and actually gotten worse in Canada. So rather than let's have a conversation about it, we're just trying to shame and push each other down. And what I'm hoping we could accomplish one little conversation at a time is elevating the conversation. If you see somebody is misspoken, because here too, they'll one side will make fun of the other because they, you know, it's it what it's not the Senate's job, but it's the uh, I forget the other term um, in the United States right now. So either it's federal or provincial in here. So mm-hmm. they'll just attack people because they went for the wrong thing. It's like, why don't you help them understand what the problem is? Same on the science perspective. Help people understand what the problem is or if they've misunderstood something. But don't just attack them like we've been seeing. And I just think that's such a shame that we haven't been able to come together and have these discussions. So I don't know if you've seen the same kind of thing in the United States or maybe it's worse. I don't know. Yeah, I'd, I'd say from what I've seen, it's probably at least very similar to, to what yeah. you're explaining. And um, yeah, it's it's really unfortunate about how divisive it's become. And it's so easy to get caught in the weeds of you know, someone's anti this or pro that or that, you know, and or, you know, you're uh, I mean, if you even if you're me as a scientist and I'm asking questions, then I'm called a science denier. I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you can't make this stuff up. And I know. but really, at the end of the day, my, my goal isn't to to, to win the argument Deny and to, science to, to dunk on somebody and say, oh, well, I know, you know, I. I above all of that, like you said, I think it's much more important to elevate the discussion and try to have a respectful discussion and find answers. And if, if I'm wrong about something, then I want to learn, I want to understand why. Yes. And, but, and on the other hand, if, if there's something where it's a decision that I have or my family or my, you know, like we need to be able to respect each other and not just resort to attacks. If I want to not, if I want to make a decision not to take an experimental drug for a multitude of reasons, I should be able, I should be respected for that. Conversely, if if I had decided to take it, but yet somebody else said, you know, decided not to, I would want to respect them for that decision or those that have taken it. I'm not chastising anybody. I'm just saying, I think we all should be, there's been a breakdown in respect. It's just, yeah. again, one more thing that's devolved into just dividing and conquering. And it's, it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Well, I think the worst one that I've seen, unfortunately, and I deal with it um, pretty closely because I am now representing some vaccine injured individuals. Mm. And them being called anti-vaxxers and then being told oh just shut it this was for the public good and that's when i'm like you have really these individuals agreed to take this medicine that they were told was good now they're harmed they're injured and now you have the audacity to gaslight these people and suggest that i i don't even know what they're suggesting because i my, i can't even bring my head around that So I think that is just so sad. And I was going to ask you, 
because I we see it with leaders in Canada so much. It's, you know, citizens are kind of following the lead of the politicians and they're div divisive. And I do think that this is a bit of a problem here as well with this um, injury people that are injured because there's been no acknowledgement so far about anything. Um, the CDC I'm seeing is slowly being forced to make some concessions here and there. Um, mm. But in general, you see, I think you see that the leaders in the United States are, they're, they're the ones that are putting this on full display for the world. And I think as a result, people are um, having these divisive discussions and shaming and blaming and gaslighting. Um, any thoughts on how that's contributing or what you think we could do about changing that? Um, yeah, it, it doesn't help that when the, when the leaders are, are contributing to it and when, um, even public, you know, health entities and things are yeah. not willing to be open, take an, an open-minded stance and at least evaluate what is what is going on and saying you know is there any merit at all to what these people are claiming and to just say nope that's not possible or who cares and you know not even acknowledge it i mean it's it's reprehensible that you wouldn't even entertain the the notion regardless of what you know the the case the case may be if you actually evaluate pe different people and you know, I mean, n no one, I, I think just health overall and, and illness is, can't be boiled down to just any one specific thing. I mean, we're with people like, were there other confounding factors and stuff like that? But, but still to just completely ignore it and not entertain the idea or to kind of you know, like you're saying with the CDC, it seems like some of these organizations are kind of trying to find a way that they can softly admit that there might be a possibility that something could be going on without having to actually come out and say it. And yeah. I mean, it's just terrible. Well, thanks for reminding me about like I, with the public health, how important it is their messaging. Because one thing that I can't get my head around across at all is that we literally shut down the world to save one grandma. And now you ex you said it so well, it's a little bit, maybe, kind of, there might be a mistake. Where is that hard line now? Like, how do they justify this in their heads? And how is... How is nobody asking questions about that anymore? Like, it's just such a contrast in the way public health responded. Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing that they were so willing to, to shut down and take the extreme measures that they did. And then now it's like nothing happened. I mean, yeah. Um, even in, you know, I mean, my situation, I mean, I've heard from a lot of people, I know, who knows what the numbers were, people that were affected by these mandates. I, I am very blessed with the way my situation played out, even though I've still not found a new source of income or anything, but um, I, I had a lot of great support from my wife and kids and everything, but I've heard stories from people that are, that are just heartbreaking, you know, how much they've lost. Yeah. Uh, not just a job or a career, but, you know, homes and families and marriages. And I mean, it's it's heartbreaking. And yet. You would barely think anything. I mean, it's like, oh, people lost their jobs or whatever because of they were mandated. Oh, I don't know. You know, I mean, the fact that people even in in the middle of it, just were so indifferent to what was going on. I mean, I had people that just, that I knew for years in, in the industry and stuff like that, that when they found out, it was just, sorry, I don't agree, can't help you. And I was just blown away, like, you don't see anything wrong with this? Yeah. I mean, it's just shocking. Well, and great point again, as well, about the other impacts and effects. 
And the WHO, which, you know, I don't know what to think anymore, but the World Health Organization actually defines health, if you look at it, as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. And you see that and you're like, well, what the heck, people? You can't just look at the last part of that definition and forget about everything else. And, oh, gosh, I don't, I'm, I don't think we're going to go there. But even talking about what physical health is in the Western world, we're, we're not having this conversation at all, let alone mental and social well-being. So seriously, what did we do over COVID is completely disregard this WHO definition, but for the last part, which actually states not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. Mm -hmm. We threw that straight in the garbage. So I don't know any, any other thought, like, I, I don't know if you want to go there about where things are at with physical, mental, even social well-being in, um, in the West happy to chat about that a little bit and then i really want to talk about the actions we can take because that's so much more important too <laughs> yeah yeah no i think that's that's the the most important thing to me i mean um it's i i don't know because i'm not you know i'm not a uh psychologist or psychiatrist or anything like that but i mean you can see the toll that it's taken on on kids um especially and and i say that i mean my kids again were you know we're fortunate my wife and i took action to try to lessen the 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 blow as much as possible but i mean it's just so hard to see the the effects that it has had on the mental health and the development of of young people um and and, you know. and maybe I'll just jump in there because to me, it's not even about you having to be a psychologist because then we almost go straight into the, the not my expertise, but it's why aren't we having these discussions at all? Why aren't we even demanding these discussions? And I had somebody on my podcast that is very differently aligned on all of this, but on the physical health we were aligned. And he was like, yeah, no, I agree with you physical. And I'm like, great. So where was the messaging about go for a walk, mm -hmm. eat an apple? We haven't heard anything about that, at least even minimally. And so that's where it's like, this is just a very um, reasonable adult. I don't know what were common sense conversation that just seemed to have gone out the window completely let alone being like actually looking at the psychological impacts from like a psychological level. I don't even want to go there because you, you could feel it. Like you said it yourself, what was going on with your family or people around you, you feel the division. We've, I think we can, I can state pretty confidently that everyone has lost friends at, and family members. And that's wrong. That seems to go against the WHO definition. And you don't have to be a sociologist or psychologist to see that zero conversation about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, well, I'm not all about negativity. So that's why I really love what you're doing with signs to find, unless you want to say anything else about that aspect. I'd like to hear more about signs to find and what actions we can take to be better informed and be better advocates in this craziness we're in sometimes. Yeah. So again, it's, <clears throat> it's about helping people to, like I said, to understand science. I, again, in talking to people, I realized that one of the, the biggest barriers to that, to gaining that kind of, um, even just enough knowledge about it to, to be conversant, I say, to be able to carry on a conversation, to ask questions, to get into the discussion, this discussion that you were banned from if you weren't an expert. Um, yeah. You know, it is getting past the, the terminology. It's, um, as with law, you know, there's this whole jargon that becomes a separate language. And if you don't speak it, you know, I mean, you're kind of on the outside looking in and you're you're depending on someone else to translate for you because then and, and what you find with science is once you get past that that language, that jargon barrier, 
the actual concepts themselves, I mean, some of them can get quite complicated, but a lot of them, and especially the, the things that I think are really important nowadays, are um, much more within people's grasps than they might otherwise believe. And so I, I decided, well, there's got to be a way to kind of break this down and kind of help people to, to get over that barrier and start to make it more um, approachable and accessible and consumable for people. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so not just simply teaching science, biology or something. I mean, I think a lot of the way things have become in terms of education, science, education, education overall is just this massive like info download. When I was in graduate school uh, taking science courses, I mean, we were just, we had an enormous amount of information that was thrown at us and you had little to no opportunity to really digest anything, to ask questions. It was like, how much can you regurgitate? And that, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a sad state. Um, and so I know that if, you know, if you're just throwing a bunch of information at people, you know, especially this kind of information, you're going to lose them. So I thought, well, it's got to be like, can you show people in a simple way how to learn science, how to think about science in such a way that will help them, you know, equip them to better advocate for themselves? I'm not saying that um, this is going to enable people to go into a lab and do scientific research. I mean, just like you can't take an online course and then hop into a cockpit and fly a plane, you know, um, this is mm -hmm. just about learning, ar being, uh, arming someone with enough information, helping them gain the confidence to, f to find resources and information that, can, that they can um, make informed decisions. Okay, so can you give us uh, maybe a practical example or how, how this would look? Like, what is it that one of the things that you would equip people with? And is it, are these like your students? Is it through an email? Is it... Um, a course. Right. So kind of what I've started with, um, I have a, a newsletter and every week it sends out a new scientific term and it's beyond just simply a definition. I go into the, the etymology of the different terms. So this is kind of how the term was derived, how the, its meaning has changed throughout history. I think it's really illuminating to see not just a def you know a definition of a term that anybody can look up in a dictionary but in fact actually one of the things i've mentioned is that it's good to go and look at different definitions because some not all are equal depending on where you're going um and also context is really important because there's a lot of these terms that have certain meanings in general context but completely different in scientific context same word can be used or have, you know, different implications depending on how it's being being used. So it's important to to gain that kind of an understanding. So that's why um, my thought was to lay a foundation in the terminology. So to, to, to provide these terms every week, you can learn a new term and, and, and practice it in different ways. And then once you have that foundation to start building on that with concepts and things. So I'm, I'm working on some other things um, to help to start, to start that, that building process. And uh, I'm hoping to roll out a course sooner or later that will kind of give a practical process starting with that foundation of how you can um, build on that and develop you know, and hopefully enough of an understanding. And this goes through being able to evaluate research papers. How do I, how do I make heads or tails of this, you know, going through the paper and evaluating the findings and being able to determine, you know, do I think that this is valid or not? And then also then how do I uh, synthesize this and apply this to my own situation? Because ultimately the goal at the end of the day is to be able to take action. So it's, going through and helping someone, you know, build enough of an understanding to get to that point where they can take a study or whatever information and take action on it and make an informed decision, apply it to their lives. Can, can I put you on the spot and, and give, let us hear one of the examples 
especially I found that interesting where the context in the science and the general um, sphere is different. And maybe I wouldn't know about this, so that'd be good to know one term that you see is being mis misappropriated maybe is the right word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just looking at some terms the other day. Um, so one of the ones that I think is that, that is often conflated is the idea of th a theory. Um, if you mm. look up the definition of theory in a, in a dictionary, not the science, not a scientific dictionary, just a Merriam-Webster or Oxford English, do you know, one of these, um, it's going to say something about um, actually a hypothesis or a base a general supposition something that's it's going to sound very um very much um as if uncertain? it's just, um like a uh, uncertain right or 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 yeah. kind of a you know a guess right a hypothesis is yeah. in other words like an educated guess it's an, an informed yeah uh, but yeah. theory or hypothesis yeah. a, th a, a hypothesis so I think what okay. often happens is if you look at a, a dictionary definition of theory, so from a general idea, it, it's easily conflated with what a hypothesis is in, in science, which is a starting point. It's a foundation. So it's like an educated mm -hmm. guess that enables one, a scientist to design an, an experiment. It should be testable. It should uh, potentially pose a question or, or not a question, but, uh, uh, you are potential, you are providing a potential answer to a question, um, and you're testing it. Um, a theory is built on m a, a certain amount of experimentation that's been rigorously, uh, uh, uh done over a period, a considerable period of time and proven to yeah. be to some degree, uh, verifiable, a scientific theory. So yeah. that's, that's where you've taken a lot of hypotheses and you've done a lot of iterative testing. And then you get to a point where you have a certain amount of confidence and you can then, you know, try to make it into a theory to explain yeah. a phenomenon. Hypothesis. Hypothesis is, is a much more entry level, much, yeah. much, much greater level of uncertainty, not really yeah. much, uh, uh, very, uh, validity at that point, very yeah. experimental, so to speak. So, you know, but if you go and I just say, if you just look up a definition of theory, as I was saying, you, you might, you would easily mix that up with hypothesis and not understand yeah. that a theory, if I say scientific theory, I'm talking about something that's should be more well established again, still not settled, but yeah, more, there's more behind that than just a hypothesis. Yeah, no, that's such a great example. And I, as soon as you said it, it made sense to me because the common definition you think is very uncertain. And then mm -hmm. when you uh, translate that into the scientific realm, it's quite established at that point. Mm -hmm. So what a contrast there. And if you just hear the word theory, it's very important to know the context of it as well, of course. So that's really interesting. <clears throat> and then on the courses, <clears throat> I encourage you, I think that would be really interesting. And I just started doing it. I was in the same boat as you, just a little like, oh my gosh, uh, <laughs> there's so much information. I want to help people advocate for themselves and I want to elevate the conversation. So I started a course online um, it's been people have been quite receptive to it already. And I thought I made it quite elementary too. And then, you know, people were very appreciative. But then some of them told me after it's still pretty difficult to understand things. So I'm like, wow, okay. And it's such good feedback to hear. So I'm just letting you know, too. And you're probably seeing that as you're doing your newsletter as well, what's kind of sticking, but it goes to show the level of conversation. And this is something we've been talking about. How can we affect change in our lives, in our communities or our country, if, you know, our level of understanding and conversation is low? So I think that's so great. And I look forward to seeing more of what you're going to do with that uh, on the science aspect. 
Thank you. I really appreciate that. But yeah, so if there's maybe a few more things you wanted to talk about the science to find or if um, if we're good there. But like, um, I think that everyone could help. It could help elevate the discussion, just having these basic understandings. I don't know if you have maybe another example to throw at us before we wrap it up. Another another example of another term like that or well anything that's resonated with your viewer so far that you're like oh this is a good one that everyone needs to know about um i think one thing i wrote so i i, I also have a a blog that admittedly i haven't done a fantastic job of like putting out a lot of new stuff recently but one of the the articles or i started to put together write a series on um, how to how to read scientific papers because I think it's such a point of frustration for people, mm. um, especially if you have you know you, you're told that oh a new study came out saying X Y Z and we're therefore we're going to advocate for you know whatever you know especially I mean there was all of this stuff coming out with with uh, about coronavirus and stuff w with the pandemic and. You also, you had a kind of really new thing where there was a lot of studies that were coming out that were preprint. So this is before they're mm. properly peer reviewed. And there's plenty of issues that I've observed with peer review, but uh, now you have something where these, they're pushing out because of the urgency, they're pushing out these studies in preprint. And, you know, so now you've really got to try to evaluate this stuff that's not even been through a pro you know, more proper vetting process. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's very intimidating. So people were, um, very happy to see, you know, I just create, I came up with like five steps to kind of get people started to, you know, how do you approach reading a scientific paper? Just, you know, you pick it up. What do I do? How do I, you know, how do I make heads or tails of this? And, um, what's you know, your, what's the first step? The, the, the first thing I think I said is, you know, get a, get a pad, uh, a pen and, and a highlighter, because for me, I, I go through a paper and I want to highlight and make notes or I want to write down if I come up with things and I'm like, I don't know what this means or I want to go and look deep more into this. So yeah. especially if you're starting from a point where you're probably going to run into a, things that you might not know what they are, you definitely want to be able to ha make notes on the paper or at least have something that you can write notes I had a uh, a PI early in my career that said three things that you should always have with you were a pen, uh, something to write on, and a flashlight. Because he says you never know when you're going to get you know a great idea. He said you know might, even in the middle of the night you might wake up and ah oh, you know you don't want to forget something and you you know you want to be able to yeah. write it down. So I was like my first thing was like you got to have those something like that where you can you know if you're reading a paper, I mean you you want to be able to if you come on something that, oh, I, I want to remember to look more into this or what does this mean? You know, first thing, get yourself set up so you're able to attack it, you know, so that you can yeah. go through it and not just be thrown off because you're going to come up upon something that's going to where you're going to go, what the heck is this? Or you might get frustrated or overwhelmed. And but you want to be able to if you're if you're set up there and you got it, you know, OK, well, I'll just write this down or I'll highlight this. I'll make it. I'll go back to it, you know, bring it down to a level where oh, this is not that bad. I can do this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I did want to talk about that briefly, too, is um, like um, articles, scientific articles and journals, because they can look overwhelming. But I think that there is also um, a reminder to people if they haven't really looked at them. There's jet, there's always an abstract, I think, an mm -hmm. abstract. So like a, a dense summary, an introduction, which is very helpful usually, and a conclusion. Like the meatiest part of a journal um, or article is the how things came to be. And maybe mm -hmm. that takes a little bit more scientific brains and understanding, but to understand an abstract, uh, the intro and a conclusion, generally, if you, you know, you have a, generally, I think it's doable for anyone. And then one thing to highlight too, I'm sure you tell your uh, 
viewers and things is to look at the funding and if there's any conflicts mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. bias. That's right in the paper. And a lot of people, I don't know if they know that. So I think that's so important to highlight. Yeah, those are fantastic points. And I think that's, those were definitely on my list, especially looking at the abstract, because it can be so helpful in um, getting an understanding of the, of a paper also in, I mean, look, I'm not going to lie. Like it takes time to go through a scientific study, especially if it's yes. worthwhile. Um, and by reading an abstract, you can gain enough information generally to decide, is it worthwhile investing my time into that? And so I think it's a great way yeah. to start and learn a little bit about the paper, but also to be able to say, oh, well, maybe this really isn't going to help me or this isn't really what I was looking for. All right, well, then I'm not going to waste, you know, whatever time going through that. I'll go back to my search and find the next one and see what that says. And I find it was something you said just earlier, and then I thought of how important it is to really go to the source too. And it's an example I'll give is I had bought a strawberry kiwi drink and it says strawberry kiwi on the front of it. Then you look at the ingredients. There's not one ingredient that says strawberry or kiwi. And I think we find that sometimes, and I'm sure you probably see it a lot more than I do, is the there's a headline about a study saying this this and x y and z and then you go to the article and it says a b c and i think we have to understand that we're being marketed to um that people have interest that they're playing to and it's our obligation to look into it and make sure and that's why you know um being your own advocate is the most important thing. So I don't know if that's something you've seen a lot of or were frustrated with and another reason that you you thought this was an important way to go. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I think, I think there's a lot of validity in what you're saying there. And <clears throat> I mean, with respect to scientific papers, I mean, scientists definitely kind of play those kinds of games too. So if you're just looking at headlines, you can you can definitely be misled and you want to you want to go in and dig deeper and be able to evaluate the paper and determine for yourself it, you know it, it are the claims that they're making actually backed up by the the data that they've generated and et cetera et cetera and um and not just you know <laughs> read the headline and say oh well look they found they did it they found, you know because it's you know yeah it's often you're, you're writing a paper for, I mean, again, most scientific papers, you know, I hate to say it, are written to other scientists and they're written with the expectation that scientists are reading them and that's the audience and they're written in such a way that you're trying to get, especially the, you know, the abstract, you want to pull the reader in, you want them, you want them to read your paper and cite your paper as this is a, 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 credible source on this topic and this finding is good, you know, and so yeah. you're trying to pull them in. But again, the audience is scientists. So yeah. You know. Well, I think that through all this craziness, um, there has been so much good because then people are stepping up and doing things that likely they wouldn't be doing before. Now we have a Mr. Mike that is helping to translate the scientific jargon for people to understand a little bit better. And at least we have these positive things coming out of this craziness that we've been on. So thank you so much for that. I think we've had quite the good discussion. I think we've thrown out some things that will help people understand already after watching this, that it's not that intimidating to look at a scientific journal and it might be worthwhile to do it Um so thank you so much for that. If there's anything else, and also let people know where they could find you, please. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, thank you. I really enjoyed the discussion. And I, I truly hope that, that we've inspired some people to, to take a look at studies and start uh, advocating for themselves. It's, it's one of them, I think in my mind, it's one of the most powerful things we can do for ourselves and our loved ones in, in these days. Um, so I can be found, um, pretty much through on social media, I guess, m mostly on uh, Twitter or X or whatever it's called these days. If you go to at Mike Donio, or you can go to at Science Defined, 
And you can also find the science, science to find at just science to find.com. So I try to keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> um, Perfect. I also have a Substack um, newsletter. It's just Mike Donio.substack.com. Um, and you know, if, if you have questions or anything, my, I think, you know, I'm not always very technologically, uh, adept, but I, my, um, there should be ways to contact me. My, my, I think my DMS are open. There should be email addresses and things on science to find.com or, or ways that you can contact me. And I would strongly encourage you if you have questions, uh, or if you're, you're hung up on you know, something about trying to read a paper or anything, you know, where you're trying to find information about a particular topic or just in general, reach out, please. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that. I'm sure people will reach out after this. And if your DMs aren't open, I'm sure you'll find out too. <laughs> Somebody will tell you. But thank you. That was wonderful. Very helpful. I think, you know, a little bit at a time we can elevate this um, the conversation on a global level, but it's just one conversation at a time for now. Um, so we'll wrap up here, but then we'll I'll still have you for a few more minutes for the paid uh, ex-subscribers in a moment. So thanks again, Mike. Thank you.